Exercise 1. Traditional economic models often assume that people make choices aiming to maximize their own satisfaction. Maximizing satisfaction does not necessarily mean paying the least amount of money. Rather, it can also be seen as maximizing prestige gained through admiration from others who observe the consumption. An example of such a view can be found in Miller's Dialects of Shopping. Miller argues that shopping often results in an innate contradiction between saving money and ethical decisions. Saving money benefits the shopper or immediate family. Conversely, while making ethical decisions, such as buying more expensive but ethically produced items, the benefit is transferred to distant others. One way to overcome this contradiction is by engaging in socially responsible conspicuous consumption. When engaging in socially responsible conspicuous consumption, essentially self interested motives such as prestige, promise of better health or taste compensate for the higher price paid. Thus, the higher price becomes justifiable as non price advantages are gained by the consumer, and the monetary benefit transferred to the distant producer is converted into immediate benefits for the consumer. Exercise 2 Drawings can add value by connecting cognition to physiology and engaging other senses. Good drawings develop their relationships with the reader from the initial eye contact onwards to draw in other senses, which then start working together to give the picture greater meaning. A good map makes you want to touch the image, find interrelationships, talk to the person next to you about it. If you've ever been in London, you may recall just how tactile the tube map is. It invites you to trace your route with your finger, to share your perspective on it with your traveling companions, to annotate it with additions, reminders, and doodles. Recent studies have shown how even doodling can aid recall and involvement. As former GM Vice Chairman Bob Lutz said, I can look at old sketches done in meetings 40 years ago. An experience set in recall of the room, the table, the voices. Once you have added physically to a map, a drawing, or even a blank piece of paper, you have a greater mental and physical connection with it. And this in turn helps you to remember. Just as when you write a shopping list, but forget to bring it with you, the muscle memory of scratching things on a pad helps you to recall what you needed. Exercise 3. Delay is a necessary component of procrastination. This means not only that someone who procrastinates fails to do something that she previously intended to do, but it also requires that she has not given up entirely on completing the task. Deciding not to do something ever is not procrastination, no matter how irrational or self defeating this decision is. Note further that delaying a task needs to be distinguished from departing from a scheduled time. Schedules and deadlines are means of making explicit and specific our temporal intentions. But we can delay doing something even if our plans are rather vague. For a person's behavior to count as delay, however, it must depart significantly from the intention, and it must be possible to attribute to the individual. An intention to actually do something to advance a goal. Someone who had a strong desire to climb Mount Everest but never did anything to advance that goal would not count as procrastinating if she never moved from fantasizing to planning. Exercise 4. With overt violence being disallowed, competition between groups flowed through another channel, consisting, ironically, of an escalating refinement of manners. Demand for self control increased as courts grew even larger and chains of interdependency became more differentiated. With growing integration, the contrasts between noble and bourgeois classes diminished, leading to a heightened sensitivity to nuances of conduct and minute gestures. The former knights, who were now courtiers, preserved their contempt for those of a lower rank, particularly the bourgeois. Tensions between courtiers and bourgeois were heightened as the former became progressively impoverished and the rising bourgeois richer and more powerful. 
Faced with competition from the bourgeois, the courtiers could not resort to overt violence as in the past. Instead, their fears were manifested in a general revulsion, with disgust at anything that smelt bourgeois being associated with vulgarity. Courtiers competed instead by means of manners, modifying their speech, gestures, and social amusements to maintain a distinctive distance from the unpleasant pressure from below. Exercise five. One interesting phenomenon that takes place in connection with the practice of silence is that the mind evolves creative genius. For instance, when a person who is used to intense activity and outer diversion for his pastime and pleasure is thrown suddenly on his own inner resources, if he is not thwarted by it, his mind will have a peculiar reaction, and he will discover his inherent reserve and originality. This also is true in connection with children's education. If we do not try to keep their minds altogether occupied with artificial toys and noisy games, they will work and invent newer ones. And this quickening of the inner faculties is the gist of true education. We think better when our mind is not weighted down by matter. We see more clearly when our eyes are focused on a single objective, and nothing is more effective towards this end than the practice of silence. Exercise six: ninety percent of the data in the world today was created in the past two years alone. Yet, instead of taking advantage of the new opportunities this revolution presents, the vast majority of people almost mindlessly consume content that others have created. Former Google design ethicist Tristan Harris has called out the fact that app design practices have us glued to our phones. Today's apps and websites have been engineered so that we maximize our screen time, and companies that manage to seize our attention are showered with profits. Harris has called our gut reactions to the attention economy a race to the bottom of the brainstem. He told the Atlantic. You could say that it's my responsibility to exert self-control when it comes to digital usage, but that's not acknowledging that there is a thousand people on the other side of the screen whose job is to break down whatever responsibility I can maintain. Many people who think they control their phones are in reality controlled by them. Exercise seven: Language is one of our defining traits as a species. But we are probably the only animal in which two of its individuals, plucked from different places, even right next door, might not be able to communicate with one another, almost as if they were two different biological species. Sometimes, even speakers of the same language can confuse one another. A young English boy I know, traveling in America, was told by someone who overheard him speaking. I can tell from your accent that you're from somewhere in Europe. By comparison to our linguistic isolation, you could take a gorilla from its troop and put it in any other troop wherever gorillas are found, and it would know what to do. There would probably be some fighting over territory and attempts at establishing who is dominant over whom, but for the most part, life would be routine. The new gorilla would communicate as all gorillas communicate. Fight as gorillas fight, make the same kind of nest, and eat the same kinds of food. Exercise eight: To really understand the complex life cycle and social behavior of chimpanzees, you need time. Chimpanzees, like the other great apes, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and humans, mature very slowly. Infants continue to share their mother's nest, ride her back, and suckle. Though less frequently, until about five years old, when the next offspring is often born, and even then they remain emotionally connected to their mother, traveling with her for several years, strengthening family bonds that may persist throughout life. A female will not have her first infant until she is between ten and thirteen years old, and like humans and other great apes, she has a long gestation period. About eight months for chimpanzees, and there is an interval averaging five years between births. Chimpanzees can live to be over fifty years in the wild, and up to seventy years in captivity.
As a result of this long life and the fact that each individual has his or her own distinct personality, any worthwhile behavioral study of chimpanzees must be long-term and must concentrate on individual life histories. Exercise nine: Computers have changed a lot in the past twenty-five years. Computer networks were rudimentary in the nineteen nineties. The explosive growth of the internet and the proliferation of connected devices changed everything. It also gave us a much better metaphor for how the human brain works. Networked mobile computers can do much more than the desktop computer of the nineteen nineties. This isn't just because they're better at storing and handling data. What's really important is their ability to share data, programs, and processing power. The connectedness of today's computers has helped scientists to realize that the computer inside the human skull also owes much of its power to its ability to be in a network, to be part of an us. We humans learn from others. We put our heads together and think things over. We share our feelings and feel each other's pain. Connectedness is vital for our mental health. Children who have been neglected and not allowed social contact don't just grow up ignorant of the world. Their brain development is often delayed or impaired. Exercise ten: A virtue that a quest for meaning builds is thinking abstractly. People often think of abstraction as stripping away meaning, but in fact, abstraction does the opposite. It enriches meaning. When you see that two things have similar structures or behavior, then those similarities create a connection, a new meaning for you that wasn't there before. Henri Poincaré famously said that mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. To which a poet quipped, "Poetry is the art of giving different names to the same thing." If you've only ever seen one dog, you might think that a dog must be a German Shepherd. Once you've seen several, you begin to realize that the meaning of dog is richer than you realized. Abstraction enriches meaning by helping you to take a collection of examples and to see just what is essential about, for instance, dogness. In so doing, you see what's the same about many different things. Exercise eleven. When you give an oral presentation, a core message-first approach provides you with a time advantage. Starting with your core message increases the likelihood that your audience walks away with the message that you want them to walk away with, even when you are running out of time. Although you should not underestimate the importance of proper timekeeping, there may always be reasons why you find yourself short of time at the end of your presentation, in spite of all your efforts to the contrary. Perhaps you are just generally predisposed to run out of time in everything you do, or perhaps you encountered some unexpected interruptions ranging from faulty equipment to clarification questions. Whatever the reason, we've all been there. The one-minute-left sign flashes, and you are barely halfway through your presentation. You will have to cut parts of your presentation, speed up, and all of this goes at the expense of the core message that you had planned to deliver at the end. You can save yourself a considerable amount of stress by starting rather than ending your presentation with your core message. Exercise twelve. Nothing lasts forever, as the saying goes. There are waggish types who move from that thought to the conclusion that sustainability is a logical impossibility. Yet, who said that a practice or process has to continue throughout eternity in order to be considered sustainable? There are many ways to measure how long or to what extent a practice can endure, given its background conditions. There is no reason to think that it is not sustainable just because there is some dramatic change in those conditions. This is the "What would happen if the Earth was hit by a comet?" thought experiment. Current thinking is that a mass extinction event occurred when some large celestial objects struck our planet about 65 million years ago. The climatic disruption led to the extinction of an estimated 50 percent of the species in existence at that time.
it is not clear what someone might mean by saying that these extinct species had an unsustainable life process because they did not survive a meteor impact.